Hello, friends. Okay, we're going to get started in our second week um, of the Armor of God study. I'm just going to go over. It's really, really intensive. And I mean, it's not intensive. That's the wrong word. Um, it's just filled with such good stuff, you guys. And I highly recommend you do it yourself. But for those who are time challenged, I want to help you guys. So I'm just going to go over some stuff week to week. Uh, try to highlight as much as I can so that you feel that you get a little something in the season from God. And I believe that he has so much, just so much stuff to share with you guys and that he loves you and he's there for you. So we're just going to get started. Okay. Um, just going to start in prayer. Uh, Father, Lord, I just thank you for this day. I thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy and your loving kindness. I just, I just pray that there are those people in Facebook land and Instagram land who are just hungry for you, Lord. They're hungry for you. They're hungry for your word. They're hungry to know you better. They want to have help in this season of difficulty, Lord, whatever they're facing. I pray, Lord, that you would just bless them and honor them, honor their time um, as they spend time with you, Lord, and that you would help them understand your word and the armor of God in which we're studying. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to talk about sizing up the enemy, okay? So last week, if you didn't see that video, I highly recommend you go back and watch it. Um, we are discussing Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 10 through 19. And I read that to you guys last week and kind of as an overview, um, as I was reading the scripture, I was explaining what all the pieces of the armor is. And we're going to get into more detail with that in the weeks to come. This first week is kind of about sizing up the enemy. Um, who's our enemy? It's Satan, right? And his demonic kingdom. So something um, we're going to talk about today has to do with who he is um, and learning about how we can recognize him working in our lives undercover because um, we're just going to learn that a lot of things that the word of God says about him. We're going to read some scriptures and uh, we're just going to lift the veil off of his disguise, you know, like the Bible compares him to like an angel of light. Like that's how deceiving his, he is, that he would just, he, his trickery is so good, you guys. Like his trickery and the way that he orchestrates things and people and different situations and you can, like it's so close, you guys. Sometimes it's so close to looking good, you know, and, um, you know, some things that's just not blatant to see. So we're going to learn all about that now. Okay. So sizing up the enemy is what this little, uh, area is, or this little thing that I'm reading to you is called, uh, week one. Uh, and okay. So an invisible battle is taking place where you and I get the privilege of swaying the balance towards victory in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, so according to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, so we're talking about verse 12, what does it mean to put on your full armor of God? Okay, so she's going to go through several points, and I'm just going to read those to you guys, and um, we're going to get to an area where you're going to kind of start relating it to your life and just think about stuff. Even if you have a piece of paper and a pen and your Bible, that would be great because you could just watch this and then later go back if you need to. All right, so the first point she makes is the battle, you guys, it's unavoidable, um, meaning you're not going to have this life and have no battles. That's just impossible. We live in a fallen world. We live in, um, a, you know, a state of, you know, people have a sin nature, and so we're always battling with that, and um, so just we live where there's evil and bad things happening, uh, so, you know, the battle against Satan and his enemy, our enemies, you know, uh, is unavoidable, you guys. So if we can't avoid something, shouldn't we learn how to fight it? Right? I think so. So um, we have trials and hardships because we live in a broken world. So the first, that's the first one, okay? The second one is the enemy is invisible, you guys. So you can't see Satan with your eyes. It's not like you walk into a room and you just see Satan standing right there. No, he's in like he's invisible. And um but and he works through uh spiritual realms, you know? Spiritual realms and we'll learn about that in a minute. 
Uh, so when he is working, a lot of times he works through people also. So people, he's influencing our minds. He's influencing our thought processes. You know, um, it's like as if he is standing right here talking to us, you know, putting putting things into our minds. And that's why we have to always watch what we are listening to and check our thought life because our thought life, you know, it, it, you know, God knows every thought that we think is what the word of God says, but not every thought we think is our thought. Some of them are the devil's thoughts and he's trying to, re that's where he gets us, you guys, with temptation, it's temptation and the devil can work through other people and them in real life, you know, sowing in seeds of temptation with you. But the devil can come and put things into our minds and get us to start thinking about the things of the lusts of this world, the things that are ungodly and unrighteous and unholy that would lead us to hurt God's heart and lead us away from God and his goodness and what he has for us. And, and he wants us to be disobedient, you guys. He, the devil. He wants us not to follow God. He doesn't want us to know God at all. So the battle is unavoidable and the battle is invisible. And those things are happening. We don't see it necessarily with our naked eye, but there is a spiritual realm and a spiritual world. Um, after all, God is spirit, right? Okay. So, um, so like I said, he attacks us in our thought life, our emotions, and in our willpower. You know, so when you think about that, just think about uh, what kind of stuff do you struggle with? Like, what's a temptation for you? Um, some people's a temptation to drink a lot. Some people's a temptation to smoke weed, you know, and um, some people's to lie and steal. You know, they have that propensity that they want to do these things. And that's a, an area the enemy tests them a lot a lot with so um emotions you know the enemy can affect your emotions and get and lie to you and make you feel like your emotions are really valid you know our emotions change every day you guys so what you feel today um and you make a decision like a really important decision or you do something out of your anger or out of your frustration or you hurt somebody that you really love you know through your words you know, our words are super powerful and, and sometimes words saying, uh, receiving words on the other side of it, when someone's mean spirited to you or say something harsh to you, that hurts, that can hurt your spirit, you know? And so that's how the enemy uses people to attack us. Um, so your willpower and your thought life, think about the people who are depressed, you know, the people who are. Uh, struggling with anxiety and fear and panic and suicidal thoughts. I mean, all of that is not of their own making. That's coming from the enemy because the enemy doesn't want someone to be successful in life. They don't want, they don't, he doesn't want you to continue following Christ and to keep on keeping on with for the kingdom of God. And he doesn't want you to take up your cross and follow God. So he's going to put, a, he's going to bombard your mind constantly. And so we need to put on the armor. Okay. Another uh, point is Satan is not God's peer or counterpart. And that's really important because I think as Christians, people don't realize that or they don't think that. They're like, you know, wow. Okay. They think for some reason that Satan is equal to God. You guys, Satan is a created being. God created him as Lucifer, an cherub angel, and he was in heaven and he rebelled and he got sent into the earthly realm. So he's, he's a created being and a created being is not more powerful than the creator, which is God. Um, so that's important to realize that, you know, he's really not that powerful. I mean, he's got skill and he's, um, I keep saying indivisible, invisible, you know, and he does have with his trickery and mind games and different ways he uses people to attack us. Um, 
in that way he kind of has power but it's not bigger and greater than god's power and so we need to put that back in you know the right focus we need to really understand that god is in is the one who's got all the power okay the word of god says that our god is omnipresent which is a fancy way of saying he's all present all the time. He's everywhere. He's with me right now in this room. He's with you in your room when you're watching this. He's with your children at school. He's with your spouse at work. He's with you at work if you're watching this in the bathroom trying to take a break. I mean, I used to do that. <laughs> or at the nurse's station. He's with you. He's with you. He's with everybody. He's everywhere all at once. And it blows our mind because we live in time. God created time, space, matter, the world. And he doesn't live here. He lives outside of time. Okay? So it's hard for our human minds to fully grasp that. And some things we just won't grasp till we're home with the Lord. You know? It's like we just have to say, okay, God, I don't understand all that. I give that to you, Lord. And just trust it. You know? But that's one thing. He's all present. Guess what? The devil is not all present, you guys. <sighs> He's not everywhere at once. He's not God. Okay? Yes, he has a demonic realm and he has uh, demonic entities that kind of work. They all work with each other. And certain ones are assigned to family. And that's how they know stuff. I mean, I've learned so much, you guys. I can't wait to pass all this to you. So, the demonic realm and demons and Satan, which is like their general uh they are not everywhere all at once like god is uh another th characteristic of god is that he is oh gosh you guys i'm gonna butcher this stuff omnipotent i think is how you say it okay that means all powerful think about potent like something is super strong okay so when you're thinking about it like that god is all powerful he has all power and so when you're comparing him to, and Satan together, there's no way that Satan is all powerful. He's a created being. He's not all powerful. The only power really Satan has over you is if you give him pow the power. If you agree with him, if you go along with him, if you don't resist the enemy. The word of God says, resist Satan and he will flee from you. If you resist temptation, he will flee. So that's what we're supposed to do as believers. If we believe like, hey, you know, I can... I can say no. I don't have to do that just because my granddaddy did that and my gr my grandpapa or my uncle or whatever. Like you can say no. You can say no to things that you're you see in the generational stuff happening. You know, I say no to that over my kids too. You know, break generational curses. You don't have to involve yourself in sin and iniquities, and you can break those off. You don't have to align yourself with Satan and his kingdom. He is not more powerful than Christ in you. Believe it or not, I don't know if you know this, but you have more power than he does because you have Christ. You have the one that raised Jesus from the dead. That is Holy Spirit inside of a believer. And you have that power and that authority in Jesus Christ. So he's all present everywhere at once. Satan is not. He's all powerful. Super, super duper uh, like a strong hero of heroes that you can ever think of, you know? Um, that's who God is, that he's all powerful. He can do whatever he wants to do, okay? Um, and the other one is, oh, I hate that word, omniscient. Oh gosh, you guys, I'm butchering it. It's omniscience, okay? <laughs> so basically that means he's all knowing, because science is like knowledge, right? So God is all-knowing. He knows all things. And that's really comforting, but also like really scary. You know, if you have a healthy reverential fear of the Lord and you know that he knows all of your secret thoughts, he knows everything you've ever done, like that's the super like humbling and sobering fact, right? So um, he is all knowing. So he knows all things. He knows what's going to happen before it happens. He knows what challenges you're having currently. He knew about them before. I'm not saying he caused them, although God does test us. But we need to know that he is aware when we're going through a hard time, 
we're going through a, a challenge, you guys. God is aware. He knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. He's Alpha and Omega. He's all of it. And God, um, our God can work miracles. He's the only God that can work miracles. The Bible goes over um, different, uh, you know, in different scriptures where we see a lot of people practicing magic. It's really black magic. It's demonic magic. Trying to uh, remake, uh, recreate things of the Lord that the Lord, for example, I'm thinking of Moses when um, he was, God kept sending him to the Pharaoh, you know, you, he wants his people to be set free. And so God would do something through Moses and it would be a supernatural sign. And so the Pharaoh, you know, they had a lot of uh, people who did black magic and, uh, you know, they, they worshiped a lot of false gods. And um, so I, so they would try to like do the same thing. And sometimes it was being able to be recreated, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that's why you have to be careful, you know, what you let yourself believe. But, um, the devil, what I've come to find out is the devil is the imitator of God. Okay. But he's not creative. He has no creative power and he's not all powerful. Okay. So God can only do miracles and the devil can't do miracles and God is eternal. Okay. God is forever. God, God is infinity. And inf I mean, infinity means forever. It means it always was, always will be all of that. So that's what God is. God is eternal. Because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are seated with him in heavenly places. Okay. So the location uh, is accessible. So where we can get our armor to fight against the devil, uh, the location is accessible because of what I just read. Because we, if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are seated with him in heavenly places. So we have access through Christ to heavenly places. And Christ right now is at the right hand of the Father. And he is our, our advocate, our intercessor. And so he is helping us to learn these things and apply these things. And, and highlighting us through the power of the Holy Spirit what, who dwells and dwells us. So your weapons are not physical. So this just is reiterating that are, you know, the things that God does, um, we see things in the natural, but God also has an aspect of it in, in the spiritual realm. And Paul is describing a, a physical, he's describing physical Roman, you know, armor, like gear, outfit uh, of the soldier, but God is giving us spiritual armor. The victory is irrevocable, meaning that God has already won. Hallelujah. Have you read the end of the book? The end of the book tells it all. So we know that as believers that Jesus has just conquered over death, over sin, over the enemy, over everything. And that if we have Christ, if we are born again and we love the Lord, then that means that we not only do we get to go to heaven, but we get to live victorious in the life now, you guys, and in the life to come. So God has already won. So, you know, in a lot of ways, that should make us more bold and make us have less fear because we know like God, he's already, he's already worked this all out and we just have to play our part. And so if we know the end of the movie or the end of the book, then it should give us confidence, you know, now to like keep on keeping on, keep following the Lord, keep pressing in. Um, so I hope that that's encouraging to you that God has already won over whatever circumstance that you guys are going through, that in the end, whatever the enemy's beating you up about, God has got victory for you in Jesus' name. All right, um, let's make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Okay, so we're gonna go um, to Ephesians chapter one, verse three. Um, and I'm gonna read that to you. Let me pause it just a second. Okay, so what I decided is I'm going to give you guys the scripture and leave it up to you to go read it because it's kind of a lot. Um, so Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. And um, so we're learning about how our armor, where we get it from. And it's a, our, what our spiritual resources are from God. 
and we're going to learn that these are all in heavenly places and I'm going to give you the scripture so y'all can go read and see that this is true. I'm not just saying this. It's not just made up. Okay. So Ephesians chapter one, verse three, it talks about our spiritual blessings being in heavenly places. Okay. Not earthly places, heavenly realm. Okay. Now, uh, Ephesians chapter one, verse 20 talks about Christ now is in a heavenly place. And so he's our advocate. And so we have access, like I just said, not too long ago, to heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, this talks about how the demonic also is in heavenly places. So there's a war going on in heavenly places between God and his angels and Satan and his the fallen angels, his demon, demonic presence. Uh, so all of this is happening in heavenly places. Then if you want to read Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, we can see there that Paul is telling us that we are seated in heavenly places because of our relationship with Jesus. Are we there in the natural? Not yet. One day we're going to be in heaven. But right now we're on the earth. But we still have access through Christ Jesus to get these uh, weapons of warfare, spiritual weapons of warfare in heavenly places. We have access to them as believers. Uh, one thing that is very important um, is prayer. So prayer helps us to tap into the heavenly places, even though we live on the earth, you guys. So prayer is like the glue that helps keep us attached to the things of God in heaven and this, this armor that he wants for us to keep continually remembering that we have. And so that prayer activates the armor is what it says. It's like our internet access. Wow, that's so cool. I mean, like, Think about how you, like 100 years ago, people, even like 20, 30 years ago, people didn't have this technology. Even us as, like me as a kid, I didn't have a, a cell phone. I didn't even have a beeper, y'all. Boo to you, mom and dad, it didn't get me a beeper. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I'm just saying like, we, technology has, I mean, now you can talk to people all around the world, like FaceTime and like what we're doing right now, Facebook and all that kind of stuff. Um, so how you can do that, there's those things in the supernatural realm too. And the number one thing that really does that is prayer. Prayer helps you access God and all the good things that he has for us. So I hope that makes sense. It's like the internet. That's so cool to think about it. It's like the internet way, the internet highway is prayer. Um, if you can think of it like that. Okay. So Isaiah chapter now this is old testament okay guys isaiah 59 chapter 59 verse 17 through 18 um this this scripture describes god as a divine warrior uh that is why paul may be using this armor also to describe it because god described himself like that in isaiah and it's a beautiful picture of god being a warrior and and a warrior for us so I highly recommend you read that because it's super, so nice to read that the Lord described himself like that. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 4, pulling down strongholds, uh, have to use the full armor of God. Okay, so in 2 Corinthians, it's probably talking about how, you know, there, there are strongholds. You know, there are foot, what is it called? Foot opening door. I forget foot something. I know it's not foothold. But anyways, you know, you when you fall into sin, you can open a little door to let the demonic realm really affect your life even more. So it's like you've given them legal rights. So now they're coming in and they're attacking you more. They're speaking to you more because you haven't kept on your armor and you've, you know, you've fallen into sin. And so they have more of a legal uh, way of coming in and communicating with you and uh, and messing with you and that's that's really good to know that the armor we can pull we can we can ask the Lord that you know through repentance and a sorrowful heart and uh, through prayer 
and asking the Lord to close those doors that we've opened, you know, and just aligning ourselves with God's word and his truths again and allowing him to uh, do those things for us through prayer and petition and sorrowful contrition of the heart that we've sinned against him. So, you know, if you have a stronghold, um, strongholds could be like pornography, you have addiction to that, to drugs, to just, you know, alcohol, alcoholic addiction, um, eating, it, you know, you, if you have really super bad uh, self-confidence, I'm not saying that in itself is a sin, but we want to fill our minds up and ask the Lord to help us to see ourselves and love ourselves the way that He loves us and sees us and, and um, to, to walk our lives thinking about Him and His opinion. So sometimes we have these strongholds in our lives, but we haven't fully given ourselves over to Christ. We haven't fully trusted in Him um, at all, really. To, you know, we've kind of been up trying to take care of our lives ourselves, you guys. We're trying to do everything in our own strength. We're trying to resist temptation ourselves, but then we're just not strong enough. We need Christ. We need Holy Spirit to help us. You know, He's so loving and so kind. So I just want to encourage you today that if you're dealing with a stronghold or you have a family member that has a stronghold or something like that, you know that you pray and you seek God out and you ask him for, for his help and you ask him to deliver you or this person and that you, you would be helped by him to resist the enemy and resist temptation and, and that you would want to follow Christ in Jesus' name, okay? So the enemy wants to beat us up and tire us out so that we cannot pray. So that's that's important to know. For our wrestle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms or heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. So just think about the most difficult person or situation, uh, pressing problem or circumstance that you have. And when you're thinking about that, um, whatever it is, just know that underneath that person or that situation are these other things under the surface. So your struggle, it's not against flesh and blood or people. It's against these rulers, authorities, powers of the dark world, spiritual forces of evil and heavenly places. And those things are entities, demonic entities, and um, it's really too much to go into today, but uh, they have a lot of power in the earth, but not more than God has, of course, but they, they've they been given dominion of the earth, and so, um, you know, they affect things on the earth and people on the earth, so it's important to kind of remember that when you're facing these things in your life, whatever's the most pressing thing right now, to understand that there's a dark force behind that working against you and attacking you through that person, through that circumstance, through that situation. Um, so to remember, to remember that, okay? So whatever is written above, or I mean that situation you have, whether a person or a circumstance, whatever it is, it's not your real problem. Hear that again, it is not your real problem. The most troubling things in your life, the things you perceive with your five physical senses are not your real issue. Wow. Uh, so though you may be wrestling with them verbally, emotionally, financially, physically, you are wasting precious time and energy that you need to reserve for the real culprit. The one who's behind the scenes striving to direct the details of some of your most accurate, of your most acute difficulties. So everything that occurs that's visible, physical world 
is directly connected to a wrestling match that is waged in the invisible spiritual world. So that's good, right? Yeah, that's really good. So um, your real enemy, the devil, wants you to ignore the spiritual reality behind the physical one. So he wants you to pay more attention to the person who's causing it or the bad situation and he doesn't want you to recognize that he's real and he's the culprit behind the scenes of it all making it happen um because of a law because as long as you're focused on what you can see with your physical eyes he can continue to run rampant underneath the surface the more you disregard him the more damage he's free to do wow the enemy will be invisible but he is not fictional wow he is very real, very persistent, waging war against us constantly. So yeah, you know, the devil does trick us and he tricks a lot of humanity uh, to think that he's not real, that, you know, he's just like a Halloween character that's, you know, got a pitchfork and some, what do you call those horns and in a red suit. Like, no, that's not, that's not how he is. You know, that's a depiction of him, but he's very crafty and he's very, very, uh, smooth and tricky you know um and he's working under the scenes according to this and your and your word of god so he's working in your relationships he's working in your in your in your uh your thought life your, your men mentality he's working there he's working your emotional life he's trying to stir up emotion um, within you to get you to follow him and not follow god and or to if you you know to cause you to sin or to have some kind of invitation of pain in your life through that way of sinning and things like that. Uh, he's affecting your physical life. He's attacking your body. He's causing accidents and different things to happen. Um, and in other ways, you know, being a believer doesn't give you immunity from the assaults of the enemy, but it does give you access to his, uh, but it does give you access to the power of the father. His power to defend you as well as uh, reverse what's already been done to you. Whoa, that's really good, you guys. That God can actually reverse. Um, there is scripture that says what the enemy meant for harm. You know, what the enemy meant to do for harm, meant to hurt me, meant to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what um, the Bible says about Satan. That he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Like he wants to take us out. But God can reverse what the enemy meant for harm. He can turn it into for good. He can make beauty out of ashes. And I've seen that in my life over and over and over that he can do uh, such healing. And he's healed me in so many ways of things that have been done to me. Um, things that were, were areas of hardship in my life. Trials, tribulations, just, you know, uh, sufferings. Sufferings, you know, that you never you're going through you never think you can get out of it like you're like I can't even how am I gonna ever get over this it, it just it doesn't seem possible it's too painful um but God is so good that it's really a supernatural work that he does in the life of his children it, you know as you as you walk with him hand in hand that he can do those things um in you and through you uh so uh be strong in the Lord and in his strength and might is what the word of God tells us um, we do have some some godly inheritance that we have as children of God. We have these spiritual riches, like we have godly blessings. Um, we have God's grace and forgiveness for our sins. Uh, we have God's power within us in our lives. Uh, we have God's authority in our lives. And like I said, we have Christ in us. We have the Holy Spirit. He helps us lead us and guide us into all truth. He helps us to resist the enemy. We, If we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, he, we can discern a lot of things that he would bring and highlight into our lives and in our minds and and um, whatever that might look like for you. You know, we have these tools and we have God's presence within us and that helps us to fight the enemy. Um, but the most important thing that Priscilla Shire wants us to know and, and get out of this is that prayer is a really super important she wants us to know that prayer is the glue. It's it's what activates uh, the armor that we have. That as we pray and we align ourselves with God's word and we are praying and, and interceding for our friends, or our family, we're interceding for ourselves, you know, like, or we're praying and asking God for something. We, we It's like 
the, the internet thing of we're talking, God is getting it, and he's releasing blessings. He's releasing um, healing. He's releasing strategy. He's giving us all these things so that we know uh, what to do in certain circumstances. If we ask him for wisdom, and James it says that he gives it to us. He gives us godly wisdom, not worldly wisdom. And if we have to make a decision, he helps us make really wise decisions. And so all of those things are godly inheritances. Like, yes, we get to go to heaven uh, when we die, but we also have these wonderful things we have while we're here. And the very root of it is prayer. It's the glue that holds it all together because uh, it just is it's putting in us in alignment with God and his heart for us. And it's allowing him to work in our hearts. Uh, when we're praying because we're it, we're communicating with him we're telling him god we we we're, we're trying to spend time with you we need you we want you to we want you to come and and show us and answer us and and lend your ear towards us and i just think that's so beautiful so it's a super powerful thing and that's something she drives through in this book that prayer is very important so um okay so we just want, oh, I just want to talk a little bit more about this, the names of Satan because I think that's super um, eye-opening. So uh, what is in a name? Okay, so, you know, we can learn a lot through the word of God about what Satan means. Satan means the, adver the adversary of God, the enemy of God. Um, he will always seek to misconstrue and, and malign the character of God. Uh, and to try to stop the purposes of God. And that's from Job chapter 1, verse 6. The devil also is slanderous. The enemy's intention is to defame and malign at the character and the intentions of God and others. So he will whisper lies in hopes of degree. Uh, ugh, can't pronounce that. Uh, he wants to basically ruin God, God's reputation and our reputation. So he's slanderous. You know, that's what that means. You're going to slander somebody. So, you know, he'll try to slander you and your job and your and with your family, your children, like wherever, wherever he tries. To, you know, those those are the ways he attacks is through slander and gossip. Um, you know, the word of God says that we'll be persecuted and through a way of persecution is being slandered, you know, being talked about, being gossiped about people coming up with as false witnesses against you for something you supposedly did, but you didn't do. So that's how he attacks us. He's our adversary. He's our enemy. Lucifer means day star and shining one. So the enemy's appearance is attractive, alluring, charming. Because of this, he can approach you with an appealing way. Um, he wants to allure you and entice you and get your attention and admiration. Like he wants you really at the end of it is like he wants you to glorify him and not God. He even tempted Jesus with that. Like if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these king. I'll give you the whole kingdoms, you know? So he's all, he's after God's worship. Like he wants to be God, but he's not. He is a created being and God is a creator. So there's just no comparison there. So uh, another thing is he's a tempster, meaning he's the one who tempts people for the purpose of enticing them into sin. So if you say, oh, God tempted me. No, temptation is of the devil. Temptation, uh, I believe is in, Ch in James, where God does test us. Um, and testing of God is for purification. You know, um, he does test us. He wants us to uh, follow him. He wants us to know that he wants to know how much we love him and that we're surrendering our hearts to him and our lives to him, trusting in him, having faith in him. And so he'll allow us to go through testing because I believe that it strengthens our character and who we are. Um, we become more Christ-like, and we are also good witnesses. Uh, if we just never have trials and tribulations, if he never allows us to go through that, then how are we going to help people? We won't be able to relate. So, you know, I went through, um, I lost two children. I went through years of infertility. That's why Julian and Elijah are six years apart. Um, if you didn't know that, that's why. And I went through um, two, I went through some very hard years, super hard years. But had I not gone through that, I mean, I'm so far removed and so healed from that. You know, it's amazing because I never thought, you know, I was just so hurt. 
but um, I can talk to people now, women and couples now who are going through that. And I can let them know the Lord loves you. He's right there. He's meeting you and that, you know, you're going through something right now, but I promise you that he's not far from you. He's not doing this to you. Um, Whatever is going to happen, that the Lord is with you and that he's going to get good things. And I will say that had I not lost the child before Elijah, Elijah would have never been born. So God does have a purpose in his plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a good future. And I truly believe that. And I know my children are with the Lord. So I can rest and enjoy my two beautiful sons now you know julian and elijah are just my heart and i just i'm just so blessed to have them and i'm so full my life is so full but back then i could have never even imagined that you know so he is a he, the devil is a one who tempts us uh god does not tempt us okay uh, the satan is the ruler of the world meaning the enemies uh the ruler of the world means that the enemy's approach is not isolated to individuals. He has a collective, cultural, and global methods designed to derail entire nations and people groups from God's intended plan. Wow. When it's talking about um, the rulers of the Stark Age and um, I forget. I have to go back here and show you guys. When it's talking about... Um, the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual uh, forces of evil in heavenly places. This is specifically what that is talking about, you guys. It's talking about there. there's a hierarchy in the enemy, uh, in the enemy's kingdom. Um, just like you would think of an army. You know, it has a general and the, and the sergeants. And I mean, I don't really know that much about armies, but you know what I'm saying? There's ranks. And that's how it is. And so there's certain entities, demonic entities that are oh, that are super um, assigned, have been assigned by the enemy over certain regions and nations and to corrupt the people and to bring worship to Satan and to allow things to usher things in uh, that are that are not glorifying to God. OK, so that's what he's, the, he's the ruler of the world. And he sends these uh, agents, demonic agents all around the world, assign, assigns them over cities, over uh, countries, nations, regions, all of that. So that is true. And he's the ruler over them all. Um, he's the prince and power of the air. The prince of darkness means that the devil is, doesn't work alone. Okay. He is the chief leader of the tribe of the dark forces who carry out his purposes in the dominion of darkness. A very real yet invisible realm that affects everything seen and heard in the physical invisible realms. So again, this is more proof that that and if you want those um, scriptures to go see those things, it's a John chapter 12, verse 31, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 and Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 where it specifically talks about Satan in these ways in his kingdom. He's the accuser, okay? Uh, he's the one who condemns. So the enemy seeks to weaken uh, believers and their, their confidence and their influence by conveying condemnation and guilt. There is no condemnation in Christ, you guys. There's no condemnation. There is God doesn't make us feel guilty. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. If you're filled with him, then you know when he's talking to you, when you're about to sin or you have sinned, you know his beautiful presence is convicting you, but it's not condemning you, okay? So there's a difference. Holy Spirit convicts us, but he doesn't make us feel condemned. He doesn't make us feel that God doesn't love us or that we're not good enough for God, or that God has abandoned us. No, okay? That is Satan. He is the accuser of the brethren. He is accusing us day and night before God, okay? He's super evil. So he's the one making you feel guilty and condemned, not God. He points out constantly reminding you of your sin and mistakes in order to cripple the believer in discouragement and shame. 
And that's Revelation 12, chapter 12, verse 10. And he, lastly, is called the father of lies. He is a liar, a falsifier. He falsifies you. He lies to you and about you, to your family, to your friends, to yourself. When you start listening to his lies and you start believing them and you start thinking that way, yeah, I am a loser. Oh my gosh, I can't do that. Like you have this fear come over you. God is calling you to step outside of yourself and do something amazing and and you're like no i can't do it you know no you can god says you can he's made you to do great and awesome powerful works of, with him with so satan is a father of lies a falsifier a liar so um that's why i mean i truly believe that's why he is so good at convincing people because not only is he a liar but he's a really good liar and he'll make something seem like totally fine. It's okay. Um, if he can get away with just saying it differently or making your feelings agree with his lies, he's just really crafty and really good at that. So, um, so that's another thing that he's a, he's a huge liar. Okay. But we need to remember that he's been disarmed. He's been embarrassed by God in Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 and then he's been overruled uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20 through 22 that God has overruled him Jesus through Jesus that he's been mastered over Phil, uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 through 11 and he's been rendered powerless wow he's been rendered powerless you guys Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and his heart his hard work, <laughs> I love that. It says all of his hard work has been destroyed. <laughs> That's about, talk about knowing the end of the book, right? Like all of his hard work has been destroyed. You know, everything he's doing right now, is, it's it's already destroyed. God has already been victorious. We're just, you know, we just... We know the end, but we haven't seen it yet, but we know the end. And so he's already been destroyed. And that's 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. So... Satan will try to distract you, discourage you, divide you from others, especially from God, especially from godly influences. If you have friends that are super loving the Lord, really walking with the Lord, um, he'll do everything in his power to try to make you uncomfortable around them or not to be involved with Bible studies, not to even like he doesn't want you watching this. You'll come up with some excuses why you shouldn't watch this. Um, so he, he just does everything that he can to, he'll try to make you busy. Busyness is not a bad thing all the time, but if it's like God has given you, convinced you in your heart that, hey, it's good for you to go and do these things. I want you to go involve yourself in this or that. It's a godly thing. It's going to get you closer to me. But then all of a sudden you're like, no, I'm not going to go. You, you know. You don't want to be around those people. It's because the enemy is influencing you, talking to you. They don't. He doesn't want you to grow closer to God and God's people. Ugh, I hate him. Uh, and Satan also wants everything that is rightly yours in Christ. So he wants your family. He wants your grandchildren that you're going to have one day or that you have. He's got, he wants your finances. He wants your home. He wants your environment. He wants your job. He just wants everything that you have and he wants to destroy it. So this is why we need to know about the armor of God. Okay. So some questions that I want to see if I can put in here. What do you think it looks like to be on guard against the enemy in practical practical everyday life? So just think about that um, to yourself. Like, what do you think it looks like to be on guard against the en enemy by just some stuff I've already mentioned? How can you, how can you? Hey guys, I'm sorry my phone kept cutting out and I need to go get my kids from school. But I just wanted to say that I want to encourage you that you press into the Lord. Um, I pray that you keep watching my videos. It's really encouraging me as I'm going through it um, to know if I'm any encouragement to any of you guys. It's such a blessing to me. Uh, so look for once a week. I recommend that you go back and watch the first week if you didn't already because it's just really important to 
plug into God. And if that's all you're doing all week long, then at least do that. So love you guys. Be praying for you. Let me know if you need anything. Okay. So put comments in the comment box and um, I'll see y'all next week. Bye.